stories. Good historical contextualization must be part of good exegesis. You might think about this as we engage, say, a text about a woman coming to draw water at noon. And then we, the reader, is called to use creative imagination. Gee, I have to give Dr. Rusicki credit for this one, too, I think. Um, I was sitting in a class, and I heard kind of, you know, in my daydream, that women in scripture are usually playing the part of either the whore or the bride. Aha! Uh -huh. I went, excuse me! And then I thought about it. Either the evil temptress or the submissive wife. And you know, that is really limiting, but boy, it sure appears to be true when you look at the women in Revelation, because what do you got there? You have Jezebel and the mother, don't you? The whore or the bride. And what's the problem there is that maybe not scripture, but the way I read it, because you know, scripture is not meant to just be purely descriptive of our human condition. And I got to tell you, most of us, men or women, are either sane or sinner, and mostly both. Scripture is meant to be prescriptive and prophetic. We're supposed to read scripture from the possibility of wholeness. A possibility of wholeness that's really transformational. That's creative imagination. You got to have that already, but not yet. We read stories looking for a foretaste, for empowerment, and for wholeness of the individual, male and female. We listen to the text performed by different voices or read with narrative eyes. We learn to see characters, for example, as round versus flat. And I want you to think about that as you read John 4 a little later. And then we always, always, always acknowledge that we are subjective in what we are reading in the text because we are reading it through our own eyes. The word might be perfect, people, but the readers are human. And human communication theory stresses that we base our understanding of words on our own schema that we have created through our own experience. And now, I have almost bored you in complete submission, which was my plan all along. That's all theory. And it's just theory until we put it into practice. And so I want to go back to the original question, OK? Who is Christ for a woman? Well, what's our premise? We got to go back to scripture as reflected on, right? OK, so I've already chosen for you a story, the woman at the well. and I. I didn't choose it for any particular reason except that I like it. You guys know I like it. I've used it in exegesis class a lot. I'm not going to read it to you. You're not going to read it to yourselves. I just want you to answer the questions that appear on the screen, screen 11. Okay, closed book questions. This is a test. Everybody, we're going to take, uh, we're going to take three minutes and I would like you to answer those questions from the storehouse of knowledge that is within you. Individuals. Setting our scene for us. Now, 
When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. His disciples had gone to the city to buy water, and a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Give me a drink. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? If you knew the gift of God, and who that it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is very deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, <coughs> with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you, know, what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is here now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Thanks, you guys. Uh, Jim, if you can. the next screen. I have that text up there for you, and I'd really like to take a little bit of time for you. Um, just look at, right now, the distribution of color. And before we move on to the next screen, let me say there's something very unusual about this particular passage. What might it be? Anybody notice anything unusual? Well, Jesus always dominates the conversation, doesn't he? And especially in John. When the Gospel of John, Jesus goes into long teaching monologues, right? Very, very long. Uh, the longest one in here are the three verses that are kind of central. But I noticed something very unusual. Uh, in context, in biblical context, what does this follow? What other story that we know very, very well? Nicodemus. What happens, Bill, in that story? Pastor Bill Rice here with us. What happens in that story? There was a conversation between a man and Jesus. Do you remember anything about how that the structure of that passage looks? Dr. Sweeney, you want to weigh in on that? What happens in the midst of that dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus? Yeah, it's, it starts off as a brief dialogue and goes into a very long monologue and is a real know, point of question as to whether the evangelist himself starts to reflect in verse 16 and following. Here, as you notice, is much more
more dialogical. Thank you. It's, there's, there is a theological discussion taking place. That perhaps is the first thing, the first um, theoethical assessment that we need to make of this text, correct it for ourselves, that we have always understood this to be um, more Jesus and less the woman. But when you look at it in color on the screen, you realize that there is an equal conversation going on. And so keep that in mind as you now open your Bibles. And Jim, if you go to the next screen. And I can only give you about five minutes to discuss the questions that I have. I have run long, but you all knew I was wordy. And I started like 10 minutes late, OK? But it was worth it to hear him say, right? So there are your questions. And in your table groups with your Bibles open, let's give this a try. Put on your hermeneutic of suspicion. Go, OK, maybe I don't know so much about this text after all. And then, um, those are the questions you just answered. Uh, discussing among yourselves and using these elements of the feminist uh, hermeneutic. Ask yourself, how about this description of the female character? What, what do I think I already know that maybe the text does not support? And if you just want to take a few minutes to talk about that among yourselves. inside the four walls of your church. No, with the economy the way it is, that might change. But I'm going to hazard to guess that most of us, even the congregations that struggle the most um, with members that are really struggling in today's economy, those are still not the poor. This world really has poor people. And those are the margins that I was referring to. Um, but we've got to engage these margins. We are not called to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are comfortable. Amen. Thank you. Um, I missed a chance last fall to hear Gustavo Gutierrez. Anybody know him? He's a Peruvian. You do. Okay, a Peruvian Roman Catholic theologian. And he says this about scripture. He says that in the hands of the subordinate other, that's people like women in church leadership, the poor, anybody at the margins, in hands like that is where we can access the incendiary character of scripture. And people, you gotta believe this Bible is not a warm and cozy fairy tale. This is fire that burns and refines. These words have power. And they're going to warm up this world. And we're the ones that have got to light the fire. Mary Ann Tolbert, who was the dean of the Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. Bet you didn't think they had one of those in Berkeley, huh? She said feminism, like other liberation movements, attempts a critique of the oppressive structures of society. Did you hear the word liberation in there? What I have been talking to you about from the standpoint of feminism is really just a kind of liberation theology. It's a way of looking at scripture as a path, a portal to freedom for humanity. Liberation movements work for justice, and that means they ultimately transform first the individual and then the world. And that sounds like Jesus. Amen? So learn to listen to this, to hear scripture from these different voices. Lights are fire. It's important. My husband said, honey, why are you girls trying to be liberated from? And I said, well, you know, I'm trying to be liberated from a really, really old idea that part of human creation is second class. It is likely that our early churches were overcome by inherited customs and prejudices regarding the status of women. And you know, once we get it in the door, it is hard to get it out. Once they created that silly cassock, they weren't gonna let go of it. 
if we go back to the very early part of the Christian church to read people like Gregory of Nyssa and Origen and their understanding of the creation accounts, we hear about this image of God in Genesis 127 as being a purely spiritual, intellectual being brought forth by God at the beginning as the created reflection of his divine lagos, of his word. This intellectual being was incorporeal and immortal, lacking mortal body and gender, yet, and remember, Genesis 1.27 is two parts. In his image, God created them, male and female, he created them. And this responds to that parallel passage. God, you see, also gave this intellectual being free choice and anticipated that it would choose disobedience. Thus, gender dualism as male and female was, this is not my take on it, but it was added by God from the beginning not as an expression of the divine image, but as a non-divine and alien characteristic in anticipation of the fall. We can turn to Dr. Statz, and I hope he will agree that the research that I did will affirm that this is more of a rabbinic understanding that comes forward into Christianity, that creation was good but then it fell and God anticipated that. And this dualism of gender that God overlays over his perfect creation, this two-piece, male and female, womanhood becomes symbolic of the division caused by pure, poor human choice, even though Eve was not alone in the garden. Somebody go back and read that passage, and Adam was with her as a symbol of spiritual poverty, womanhood was set apart, ostracized and marginalized, but only as a metaphor, people. A woman's experience of God had no venue of expression in words in most of our faith. A woman could not get up and do systematics or sermons or write serious commentaries, and so she expressed her faith and love, that spirituality that was underneath the gender overlay, she expressed it in action. And in the church, it became acceptable for that action to be removing oneself from society so that we would not tempt men to sin. I never did get that, to tell you the truth. <laughs> And women gave up their sexuality to religious vocation. And that chasteness somehow redeemed the metaphor. Some commentators, like I said before, have noted in scripture that women either take the role of bride or whore. And women called to the convent life, where sexuality was no longer expressed, entered, and still today, continue to enter into those vows dressed as brides, once inside and bound in marriage to Christ, they found a freedom to express themselves, for they were redeemed, accepted, and finally without that gender overlay. And so they were whole, transformed, ironically liberated because they were behind solid walls. And that didn't save the women outside the convents, but this kind of reading does. An evangelical hermeneutic, allow, a feminist hermeneutic, allows us to see that all women and all men, all who are made from dust, are dichotomous creatures because they are just that. They are creatures. We are creatures. At the end of the day, you guys, we ain't God. God is God and we are not. That's just how it is. We are created, we are fallen, we are saint, we are sinner, 
And as much as we'd like to make the simplicity of making men good and women bad, it's not that way. And that is not the way we have to read that book. OK. Jim, I know you're ready, but I have one last thing I got to say, because you know what? You asked me to get up here and say, who is Christ? And I'm going to answer it. I really struggled with saying, who is Christ to whom? And you know what, Jim? The summit committee seemed to struggle with that, too. Because every time I heard my topic, it was just a little bit different. And so here's what I'm going to answer. Who is Christ to someone who can never share Jesus characteristics, his male physical characteristics. Well, he's unattainable. And you know what? I know I'm not built like the guys. I'm built for a relationship. And you know what? I think that's always been true. Think of all the women in the Bible that don't have names. They're just identified by how they're related to each other. And so, I guess my answer here is that who is Jesus? He's a focus on the incarnational characteristics of the Spirit. He's the one who touches with gentleness, speaks with firmness, soothes the sick, invites relationship. Christ is relationship. But who is he to people like me who have been taught by the tradition of the very church that my embodiment, my flesh, is negative, sinful? Well, good news, Jesus experienced that too. And he showed us that it's overcomable. It's only metaphor. It's descriptive, but not prescriptive. Christ is freedom. To those who cannot go into the temples of a male world, but who experience a legalized subordination, but yet who hears in her heart and ear the welcome to work in the church, but can't get the cassock to fit, Christ is acceptance. Do you get a sense of how deeply contextualized it is to try to read from the perspective of all women or even any women? It ends up that all I can actually do in answer to the question is, is to help you see the margins and help you find some ways to answer the question from those margins. Or I can answer it for who is Christ for me? And I want to do that. And I start with Luther's paradox of the cross. Instead of starting with the lens of male, female, good, evil, power, or oppression, I hear this. God both empowers and humbles. And the revelation of God's life-giving power comes through death. And that is history and mystery. For theologians, and we're all theologians, who have stood and continue to stand at the margins of society, this perhaps is more clearly seen than those who stand at the center. We gotta die, you guys. God humbles humanity in that instance when the voices of the oppressed are heard by the ears of the privileged. And that humility, in that humility, creation is empowered to greater relationship with God, with the Creator. So who's Christ? For me, he's the one with whom I am in my deepest, most intimate relationship. I'm in it head and feet, heart and soul, and it has changed and completed me. It has taken away the overlay of the can't and made me a can-do person. It takes me back to what God originally intended for me. And if I got to pick an image today, it's that of the bridegroom. Christ is my bridegroom because the relationship between bride and groom is the most intimate.